So we've heard of Jeroboam previously in the first book of the Kings, starting around verses 12-ish, 11, 12, 13, 14, somewhere around there. Uh, but rather than go back there, I want to direct your attention seven chapters forward in 2 Kings. We find a very succinct uh, statement that helps us to understand um, verse 3. Nevertheless, he, that is Jehoram, uh, persisted in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who had made Israel sin. He did not depart from them. Now we can go quickly to chapter 10 of this, of second Kings. So when you look at two Kings 10 verse 29, Jehu, who, who again we'll, we'll meet later here, did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat. So there's the reference again, who had made Israel sin, that is from the golden calves that were at Bethel and Dan. So on the one hand, the new king in Samaria, so again, this is the king of Israel who is not a faithful king. So Jehoram has taken down the pillar of Baal. You know, so that this was, as it sounds like, a pillar, a monument, but it was it was representing the the false god Baal. And I, I, I think we talked about this previously where Baal, uh, the, the Lord in a, but, but, but not as in the Lord God. Uh, Baal is the first, uh, part of the word Baalzebub, the, the, the God of the flies. Yeah, so it's, it's a, it's a reference to, to the demonic and, and to Satan himself. And so on the one hand, Jehoram is good by removing that pillar from the site of, of Israel. Again, the nation Israel, not necessarily faithful Israel. Because, you know, you shall have no other gods before me is, is, it literally means in the Hebrew, Thou shalt have no other gods before my face, in my sight. In other words, God doesn't want to see this any more than he wants his people to see these representations of these false gods. And, and so to get rid of this pillar that was uh, representing Baal and, and would be part of, of Baal worship, false worship, idolatrous worship, that's a good thing. The context there in uh, verse 2 and 3 suggests that. Um, but nevertheless, so that he gets that, he gets rid of that, that his father had, had continued to tolerate and allow. But in verse 3, because he pr persisted in the sins of Jeroboam, again, the, ma the making of two golden calves, and caused Israel to sin as a result. So while you've gotten rid of the image of a god, a blatant image of a god, he didn't get rid of these, these more subtle images of a god, as in representing the cattle. Because God will not have his glory shared with other so-called gods which don't, which don't exist or with, or with anything in creation, the first of which are, of course, all the animals. Bulls being representative of strong animals and, and signifying strength. Remember when when Aaron, uh, while Moses is up on the mountain, he goes around collecting uh, the gold that the Egyptians had, or uh, that the Egyptians had given to the Israelites, saying, "Yeah, get out of here, go, just go." 
you know, after all the firstborn of Egypt was slain in that plague of the angel of death that God had sent upon the firstborn. And then finally, Pharaoh says, go, go, Israelites, just keep going. And all the people of Egypt had given all of this gold as a treasure and, and really as kind of a, a, a payment, a, a ransom maybe, in a, a reverse ransom at least. It's money to, hey, get out of town, hurry up. Uh, we, don't, we, don't want your God, we don't want your God bothering us anymore. You go. And so they had all that gold. And then while Moses is up on the mountain, not long after they have left from Egypt, uh, receiving the Ten Commandments, Aaron starts listening to the cries of the people. Hey, Moses ain't coming back. Because Moses was up on that mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And they began to, hey, he's not coming back. You know, he got destroyed by that, that God up there um, who is... Um, you know, thundering and, and lightning on the, on the, on the earth. And of course, then, then, uh, Aaron fashions this golden calf and says, behold the Lord, your God who brought you out of Egypt. And by that, he's, he's indicating that this is the God of strength. The God who is stronger than the Egyptian army, he, stronger than Pharaoh. And so the bulls become uh, symbolic of, of strength, particularly physical strength, not exclusively so, but particularly of, of that kind of thing. So what Jehoram here allows, as his father Jeroboam did, is the use of these golden calves in worship, still to a false god, that... Uh, that that is you know, bidding uh, um, to whom the people are pleading for strengthening. And of course, it's only in the the one Almighty God that that we find our true strength. So you know, it, it does kind of beg the question as to why he gets rid of one idol but keeps the others. Um, no. Though there, there is no rationality to the, to the fallen human mind, you know, steeped in sin as it is. At, at least in, in Jehoram's eyes, this was more palatable uh, to him. And uh, the bigger point was that he missed seeing it for what it is. You know, that it is as much an idol and as much a false god as the pillar dedicated to Baal is. And the lesson for us here is that while we do not worship, you know, we don't bend the knee to to any kind of um, other God. We hold the Holy Trinity to be the one true God. We don't set up, you know, I, um, I, idolatrous statues in our churches or in our homes. But at the same time, there's sometimes we let the stuff of, of this world um, tempt us uh, to, to trust in those things rather than God. And, you know, like like money in particular, you know, not 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 money as in, you know, we we, we need our we need our bank. We need our our cash, you know, because we need to buy, you know, Jeeps and and food and clothing and and such necessities of life it's not the money but it's the worship of money you know where 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 mammon as jesus would call it where mammon becomes uh more important to us you know it becomes it becomes godlike you know in our, our pursuit of of, of earthly wealth and earthly treasure and earthly fame and earthly fortune and all of that. You know, so in a sense, um, while it's hard to understand, at least visually, what the heck is, you know, Jehoram thinking? On, on the other hand, he, 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 he reveals to us that all fallen human creatures are not that far different.
that while we might be able to distinguish the, you know, the big false gods, we all we have to always be wary of the small or the seemingly small false gods. You know, that don't necessarily have um uh idolatrous form, but nevertheless can very much constitute idols. So this is this is one of the one of the lessons that that the Holy Spirit is teaching us just in these first three verses. You know that uh, to to learn from the example of of Jehoram and his father Jeroboam, let, lest we fall to the same same uh, same temptation, because God does not want His people to sin. Particularly because sin destroys faith. It weakens it and attacks it. And the only, the only thing by which, the only means by which we are saved is that faith that God creates through his word, by his Holy Spirit, that trusts in God, especially his gracious forgiveness of sins. Because apart from faith, there is no forgiveness. We don't make it our own. And this is why God, uh, why he leads it to say, uh, making Israel sin. Because the worst of it is not, well, the worst of it, because it's the unforgivable part. The sin is bad. But the unbelief in the forgiveness of sin is unforgivable. The sin is forgivable, except the except where there is a lack of faith to grab hold of of God's gracious gift of forgiveness, and which which is which is why God detests, especially when other. Uh, when others lead his people into sin, you know, to tempt them to fall, just like the devil himself, and for our first parents, Adam and Eve. So then we got a couple of verses here about uh, Misha, the king of Moab. He's a shepherd, calls him a sheep breeder. But it's not because they're making fancy breeds of sheep, but simply raising sheep. And what he gives here, what he pays uh, in terms of tribute to the king of Israel, is an incredible amount. Uh, would be to this day, let alone for that day. Annual payment, 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. Yeah, so that you're talking about the the producing of two hundred thousand animals, a fifth of a million. Also, that this can be given as gift to the to the king of Israel. Why does Israel want this? Again, remember, this is faith. This is not faithful Israel. This is the kingdom of Israel, and yet there's the, that there's an aspect of the the proper and true use well what's the proper and true use of lambs for god's people in the old testament that they are the animal of sacrifice uh, there needs to be a lot of lambs rams are also sacrificed but here it's highlighting their wool um not because the wool was part of the sacrifice oh well, in, in a sense it's part of the sacrifice of the ram because the rams are giving of their wool, not necessarily voluntarily, um, but they are. And the wool, of course, is being used to make all manner of garments. And and some of these lambs uh, would also be used as part of the Passover sacrifice, so that they're also going to be consumed. And thirdly, some of these are just going to be, you know, common ordinary lambs, you know, delicious lambs for lamb sandwiches and things. 
so both for their holy purpose of being sacrificed, uh, but also for their their purpose of being just plain old tasty and providing uh, providing food for God's people. You know, and this is part of the way in which God provides our daily bread. And here in this instance, doing this through a Moabite. Moabites, again, with uh, as, as a tribe, as a people group, are not believers. Some Moabites, uh, famously like Ruth, uh, was originally a Moabite and converts instead to the one true faith in the one true God. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Yeah, you know, there's there's the confession of her conversion to Israel of old, to, to the faithful people. So again, God using all people to uh, to proclaim his glory. You know, that even even the ones who don't believe in him as as Moabites would do, as uh, again as a whole. They still serve a purpose for their time in this in this world. And even while sometimes God's people fight against the Moabites, what, what this is powerfully declaring to us is that God continues to work through the me uh, through the uh, substance of even a fallen world to bless particularly his people, but all people of the world. It helps to give that context to what we read in the small catechism's explanation of the Lord's Prayer, as in, give us this day our daily bread. And then, you know, what does this mean? God gives daily bread to all people, even to the wicked. You know, and it's not intending to excuse the wicked. Yeah, or, or somehow... Um, say that their that their sins aren't um aren't significant but what it de declares is that god is that merciful that gracious to provide food for the body for all whom he has created whether they believe in him or not but for the sake of his gospel so that in learning that, wow, God feeds me. He provides for all the needs of the body. Will then allow the Holy Spirit to unlock through faith the rest of that story. That that God would be merciful to all Jew and Gentile alike. Uh, who will put their faith in him. You know, so there's there's not a. There's not a prerequisite there of becoming one particular thing in the Old Testament. But that, of course, that conversion then means you no longer have your old identity. So that even for the Jews of the Old Testament, you know, those who are Jewish by blood, after their conversion, you know, after they come to faith in the one true God of Israel, they're no longer Jewish, really, in terms of their ethnicity. I mean, they are, but but they come to the 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 the, the real significance that they are the people of God, who have no race, racial or ethnic identity because God's people come from all tribes, all tongues, all uh, peoples. The, the reference there to Moab is, is an interesting one, especially because we've seen uh, already that there is this, this conflict you know, between, between Israel and Moab and, and Judah and Moab for that matter as well yeah you know, so here they are at first under the king uh, un, under king misha 
um, Moab and Israel again as a nation, as a kingdom, not as the not as the church or the people of God in that sense. They're first friendly, but then uh, after 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 Ahab dies, that the king of Moab rebels against Israel. So now there's war again. Uh, so King Jehoram has to leave the capital city of Samaria, it's the capital of Israel. Again, the northern part, uh, the northern kingdom, and mustered all Israel. Um, then he went and went to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, "The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab?" Um, so this is now an, an alliance being made between Israel and Judah. Will you, will you join me in fighting Moab? An, an alliance not based, um, not based on, on a, a agreement in faith, so to speak. While Israel should believe in this, in the in the God of capital I Israel, again, this is where the where the terminology gets confused. Where are we what are we talking about the nation of Israel or Israel as the faithful people of God? And and here it, it's it's speaking of the the earthly kingdom use of that term. Um, and Israel agrees, I will go up. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. So we've seen that previously in Ruth, your people will be my people, my God will be your God. Um, and, and, and then we add the, you know, the horses, share and share alike. What's, what's, what's yours is ours, what's ours is yours. And, and really speaks powerfully, you know, to this, to this unity in this alliance. You know, it, it, it thereby should be strong because there is a, a sharing, not a one-sided, uh, deal, so to speak. You know, that this is the, this is how, um, God would encourage, especially his people, his church. As his church engages in the spiritual warfare against the devil and his minions, which is being signified in many of the wars that we're reading about here in the books of the Kings and the Chronicles. These are all symbols of the ongoing spiritual warfare in which we find ourselves engaged daily. And sometimes that spills out also into these uh, visible earthly uh, or earth-based conflicts but the unity I am as you are there can't be any tighter uh, affiliation or alliance what you are I am what I am you are that's really speaking powerfully you know, and, and as, as an encouragement to say, hey, I'm with you and I hope you're with me. You know, that would be a powerful thing on a battlefield. But here God means this all the more intensely. That we really are as each other. How, how God would show us that we are each equally valued members of the body of Christ. The, the Christian church on earth. And that the, the, that unity, you know, counts in, in all of the different, um, all, all the di different aspects of, of who we are and, and what we're about and what we seek to accomplish. Um, my people as your people and of course, reciprocally, your people as my people. Again, the unity. 
And and when Christians unite, you know, for a common purpose, uh, for a for a common mission, uh, for a uh, with you know commonly defined and refined goals, you know, there's there's nothing that that can stop God's people in in that regard. And again, the horses, your your horses are my horses. My horses are your horses. You know, here that's particularly as, you know, battle horses, war horses. But, but it also speaks to the, the share and share alike among brethren. Now, that doesn't mean that we take, but it certainly means that we give, you know, equally. You know, so that our brothers aren't in, in found in need. But that also comes without demands to do so. So that when we're living this life, this Christian life by the power of the gospel, this encouraging word is, is exactly that, encouragement. You know, uh, I am as you are. My people as your, my, your people, my people as your people. My horses as your horses. You know, that's not making a legal demand. But, but for us, it's making a beautiful profession of faith that this is who we are. This is how we identify uh, as in, in, in conjunction with one another. I am as you are. My people are your people. My horses is your horses. Everything I have is yours. And we say that to people who that who will not unjustly take that from us, but also be as as reciprocal in their own giving to others. Uh, the second half of verse seven. Um, the the that phrase "go up." I will go up. And we see that again. Oh, verse 22. Then they rose up early in the morning and the sun was shining on the water, you know, thus and such. But what these, both of these phrases uh, hold in common is the directionality of up. You know, go up, raise up. And, and while we know that in the context of this, this means for an army to, you know, sta stand up and, and be ready for battle. Um, at, it, it's, it's also a directional term pointing us where? Go up, rise up. To what is that pointing? Heaven. Heaven. Yes, Heaven. And so the, the use of this phrase is, is delicious in the sense that it, it means two things at the same time. Well, it does talk about, you know, get up and, and get going and get ready and, and prepare yourself for, for, for the battle. It also points us to the ultimate result of that battle and, and all the other ones that will come after that. So the getting up, especially as it's, that's encountered in the, uh, the, the armies, you know, get up, get ready, get, uh, be, be prepared to fight. And, and this going up, uh, is, is all that, that delusions to, to resurrection, you know, for, for the faithful. You know, there's more to life in this world. And, and when we live our lives, you know, with the re, with the constant remembrance of that truth, we're able to lay hold of its power. And and just like you know, you'll go up, and 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 you will win the victory because now you're living on a higher plane. You're living your life with a higher purpose. 
What about the three kings in verse 10? The, the three kings, uh, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. So notice who the three kings are in verse 9. King of Israel, king of Judah, king of Edom. Mm. Now, now, now Judah is the faithful one. You know, that's the people of God. You know, that's, that's uh, Jehoshaphat. Um, Israel, of course, should be faithful to God, but isn't so much. And, and Edom definitely is not. Yeah. It's said as a statement you know, by the king of Israel. Now, remember, this Israel is Israel in name only, not by faith. Because particularly, as he says, um, has, you know, God has called these, you know, the three kings together to, to die together. Yeah, uh, so that you know, to deliver them into the hand of Moab. You know, this is this is the king of Israel's conclusion, but not the king of Judah's uh, understanding. Again, this is significant. It's also teaching us that we should be bold when when we differ with the opinions of the world. We should be bold and, and confident in, uh, in trusting in those because we're right. Even, even if we're outnumbered, you know, outprestiged, outpowered, whatever, whatever the comparison might be with, in, in the terms of how the world looks at such things. Because as, as even uh, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, indicates, Hey, has anybody asked, really asked God if that's true? So in other words, King of Israel says, uh, the Lord has called us together to, to, uh, to lose this battle to Moab. And, and Jehoshaphat said, has anybody ever asked, has, has anybody asked the Lord about this? In other words, through worship and faith, you know, have, have you inquired of the prophet? The prophet that God provides to his people to speak God's word so that the people might hear it, receive it, believe it, learn from it, and especially to learn the lesson that the Lord provides for all needs. And, and so rightly, Jehoshaphat says, who's, who's going to pray to God and ask about this? And Elisha then um, says to the king of Israel, so again, not to Jehoshaphat, uh, but to um, Jehoram, uh, you know, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. Jehoshaphat has said, let's ask God. Has anybody asked God about his about this, about what he thinks about um, hearing his proclamation about what this all means? And then Elisha, yeah, so this is his first major interaction, at least after his his call and ordination. You know, uh, uh, states in. Um, uh, uh, Verse 14. Um, it speaks to a, a truth that God fully reveals um, elsewhere in the scriptures too. Which is, God preserves the world and the people of the world. So that's what, who's being referenced here in terms of being uh, speaking about... Um, um, Elisha speaking to Israel. Hey, if it weren't for faithful Judah, you know, and, and led by the faithful uh, King Jehoshaphat, God would not 
care about you, Israel. Because God is angry at the unfaithful. And yet God won't let his wrath be uh, uh, overflow to those who are not part of the problem. And this is one of the things that this verse is, is indicating. But, and, and to put it now in a more positive spin, for the sake of Jehoshaphat and his kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, I will have mercy on you also, or should be, my merciful actions will also fall upon you, Israel. Remember that, that parable that Jesus teaches about the wheat and the tares, the wheat and the weeds. You know, and that both are growing together in the field. Yeah, so there's, this is the parable that, that, that there's some wheat and there's some weeds. And they're both growing together. And of course, good growers, smart gardeners, the wise farmers will go and get, get rid of the weeds so that the, the, the other uh, plants can flourish. Yeah, and, and the parable of the wheat and the weeds say, yeah, the, the weeds and the and the the wheat and the weeds grow up together, but they're not separated until the time of harvest. And at the time of harvest, the the chaff, the useless grain, is uh, is burned in the fire, and and God harvests you know the good grain, and it yields it you know an, an amazing. A crop ball. It, and, and Jesus indicates that that parable is about this time now in this world. It's why God just won't zap, if you will. Why God just won't zap all the unbelievers out of the world in an instant. Can he? Yes. Does he? No. Is there a reason? Yes. In part, if God just started zapping sinners, you're sinner, you're sinner, you're sinner, you're sinner, what would you think are your chances? How safe do you think you might be? And we would you know, only fear God and his wrath because we would see our sin going, yeah, I don't stand a chance. I'm, I'm next. But God lets the wheat and the weeds grow together so that we see how merciful he is in extending life for both the wheat and the weeds. So that we are preserved to the time of harvest, to the time that when, when Christ comes to take all, you know, all into you know, the, heavenly, the, the heavenly barn to continue the, 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 the figure there. But that he will continue to work with the weeds to, to transform them into wheat also. You know, and that's what he means by and speaking to Israel here, saying, you know, I look also graciously upon you for the sake of my gracious vi uh, vision towards faithful Judah. So it's really picking up on that on that same parable that God just lets it continue to happen, not only for the 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 blessing of his family that he continues to provide, but also so that he might convince even more before it's too late to join his his holy family. So the singing here of the of the musician. So he is 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 chanting a song, a course accompanied by music. But he but he's singing like a psalm, you know, proclaiming the word of God. And and we see his song starting in verse 16. 
Thus says the Lord, make this valley full of uh, water canals or, or ditches. So here in the desert, proclaiming that, so that when you proclaim, when he's proclaiming this, uh, through the means of his voice and accompanied by song, he's preaching, he's teaching, he's evangelizing, and he's letting that word ring out into the world so that people might hear it, receive it, believe it, and and appropriate for themselves the, the attached spiritual and material blessings that, that God proclaims here too. And and of course, you know, here in this arid land, yes, let's dig some ditches, let's dig some canals. This is this ought to bring to mind uh, prior episodes in the Bible, particularly Noah. Because there's Noah in the middle of a desert building a giant ship. You know, like, like a crazy man. But he's not crazy. He's faithful. He builds that boat trusting that the God who has directed him to build that boat will demonstrate um, why it why it was why it is needed why it is necessary here dig these canals dig these ditches here in the here in the desert because they're going to be needed because I am going to fill them and and this reminds us of the promise that God had made also to the uh, children of Israel prior you're making water appear for the children of Israel in the desert, in the barren desert. You're creating an oasis for them where it didn't exist. You're solely by the, the means of his miraculous power. But then fulfilling that promise that he made. Yet yeah, dig ditches, you're going to need them. We're going to fill them with water. And we see that that's Precisely what God did, right? And, and the point of verse 17, you shall not see wind, you shall not see rain. In other words, this isn't coming from a storm from heaven. It's not coming down from heaven. It's not a rainstorm. But rather, it's, it's coming up out of the dry ground itself. The Lord is providing it in both instances, but by miraculously having these uh, water canals just fill up without the rainfall. You know, again, testifies to the power and might of the God in whom Judah believes and trusts. And then as verse 18 says, and, 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 and that's easy peasy for God, a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. And, oh, yeah, uh, delivering the Moabites so that my people can defeat them. Yeah, piece of cake. And then verse 19, just to explain that one a little bit, um, giving directive to Judah, you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city. Why? Because these are a, a people who are warring against God and his people. God's not picking the fight. The, the, they have already picked their fight. And now God is just going to go and, and finish it. And then also, so that he's going to send his people to do this, to conquer these cities. And then, and, and then to lay waste to the place. The idea being that it never is 
a, a place in which sin dwells again. This is why God will, in the end, refashion, you know, uh, take down the current heaven and earth and refashion it in the new heaven and the new earth. While he will take our bodies, as precious as they are, your body is a holy temple in which God dwells. Your body is a holy temple in which Jesus enters through the sacraments of holy baptism and a holy communion. Your body is the dwelling place of God, the Holy Trinity. Now, these are, these are all... Uh, realities, all truths. But even these ones, because they are st still riddled with sin and its effects, must be refashioned, which God will gloriously do. We recognize this by faith now, the operation of holy baptism and holy absolution, holy communion in our holy bodies. But we also acknowledge that this, while we're going to live in the same body, God's going to transform it. And, and that's what's being uh, hinted at here too. Um, with, uh, the, the, the land or the flesh. Is going to have a renewed purpose. It's not going to be used for its former purpose, whether for evil. And and again, this is why we, uh, this is why we die, and why our bodies are laid in the grave, and while they will rise again from the dead, and while they will be glorified, no longer be capable of sin, to no longer be uh, uh, harmed by death. But, but rather um, to, to, to live in the fullness and holiness of God. But that's why this latter part of verse number 19 speaks to that. They are, they are ruining the land because God doesn't want this land to support idolatry. He doesn't want it to support sin in any way. Yeah, so again, the same reason why our, our human bodies must undergo that transformation. God doesn't want that for us either. So that's why he will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that subdues all things to himself. You know, that's, that's Paul. Yeah, so that it, it's, it's, it's not so much a punishment. I mean, there's an aspect of it, but more to the point is that God does not want, wants to demonstrate that he does not support sin now or in the future. In any place. And miraculously, the very next morning, um, water comes suddenly by way of Edom and the land was filled with water. Those canals that they had dug. Uh, were filled in a day. Uh, pretty marvelous. And because God had fulfilled his promise, his people are moved and inclined to fulfill his command. So again, there's, there's a theological basis. God acts first. He fulfills his promises to us first. And then we respond to that in faith with, with our own actions. Just like this one. You know, God had done his work through his servants to uh, defeat uh, the Moabites. Um, and, and now um, he, he comes and um, establishes his own rule over it. And in verse 26, um, 700 men are taken by the king of Moab 
uh, to, to fight uh, Edom. It wouldn't matter if it was 700, 7,000, or 700,000. You know, what, what God intends to accomplish will be accomplished. And, and then verse 27, which is the, the, the icky verse in this uh, chapter. So this is the king of Moab. Um, again, pagan king, unbelieving king. Takes his eldest son who would have reigned in his place. Offers him as a burnt offering. You know, following in the example of um, there were there was a cult dedicated to the god of Molech, M O L E C H in tra English transliteration. But th that was uh, where many uh, parents in in many different countries ultimately demonstrated uh, this this the hideousness of sacrificing uh, their own children, believing that it was availing themselves of a spiritual blessing. And all it was done was, was taking the life of a, of a young person and, and, and wasting it for nothing. You know, and all of that comes you know, when, when a person's asked, well, where did they you know, even think that this would be possibly a thing? You know, we, we go back to look at the sacrifice that God appointed of firstly his son, but how he demonstrated that through the calling of, um, of Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac. And of course, God stopped Abraham's hand just at the point of, of the sacrifice. And, and in that, we, we see how God himself, of course, has appointed his son for the sacrifice. But he, once for all, he doesn't direct his people to sacrifice themselves or their children in that way. You know, not, not ever. Because the one atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ avails for the sins of all. And of course, this, this great uh, indignation and wrath against Israel, not only because they had unjustly taken the life of an innocent son, but also on, on how this directs the attention away from what this whole chapter is proclaiming. Namely, that it is it is the, the son of God who will be the once for all sacrifice for, for the sins of all. I was going to ask about the blood in the water. Yes, again, brings us our, our remembrance back to Egypt, right? Yeah. Where, where the river turns to blood. You know, and, and, and of course, going back to Egypt, the, the Egyptians couldn't drink the blood. You know, because, well, blood is nasty. It's bloody, right? Um, you know, so it, it's, it's, it's not suitable for, for drinking, for, for quenching thirst. You know, even as it wasn't for the Egyptians of old. You know, that, that God changed the Nile to, uh, you know, to blood and, and, and including in all the, the, the pots and vessels and such, uh, in the kitchens and homes of, of the, uh, Egyptians. You know, so that's the one thing that has then, uh, when they see, when it seemed to them that the water was blood. It was like, this is not drinkable. This is not usable by us. 
You know, again, and that's being seen by the Moabites. They see this, they see it as a sign, but they see it as the opposite for, for what this truly proclaims. Um, hey, this blood means we win because we're going to spill the blood of the kings that are aligned against us. What this is supposed to show to them is a sign of God's judgment against them. You know, their blood will be required. Their blood will flow to the rivers of the earth. But not so for God's people. Because the blood that is in the water, as we see it, as God's people, is life giving. So it's 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 a it's a it's a figurative, symbolic, uh, metaphorical depiction of the way how the same action of God looks different to different individuals depending on on one's perspective. For the faithful, we see it's a good thing. The unfaithful see this as as a sign of, of death and 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 receive no benefit from it though. We see in the in the holy waters of baptism the the blood of Jesus mixed in and know that when that bloody water is poured upon us, you know, we are given life through the power of that blood we uh, appre you know, we we uh, appropriate that life to ourselves but by leave believing that this blood was shed for me and we drink of that that water knowing that it's the true water of life drinking of it again in 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 holy baptism terms having a port on our head and then receiving it you know with our spiritual mouths one way of thinking of it but for the others it's death and, and and we'll use communion as an example you know for for us who drink the blood of christ believing it is what it is we receive its life-giving power <clears throat> but for those who partake of it not believing what it is our, our, and that's where, where St. Paul says is that they drink judgment upon themselves. In fact, they, they don't get the benefit. They get the opposite of the benefit. They get God's, uh, God's uh, disapproval. You know, so that the same thing can have two sides to it. Can have two different uh, effects uh, upon human beings. And, and this is just another good example. They see the blood here, the Moabites do, and think that it means victory. What well, really means their loss. Whereas as uh, God's people looking upon it from the other side, don't see blood uh, by with the eyes of, of the, with the, with physical eyes but would see the blood because everything in Christianity is 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 covered in, in the blood of the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. You know, it's all about the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Yeah, there is there is power in the blood to uh, sing sing that uh, sing the opening phrase of the chorus to that old hymn. There is power, power, power in the blood, in the blood of the Lamb. See, if we're Baptists, we could sing that every Sunday. Um, I, it's 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 a true statement, of course. But you know, but how that blood comes to us, um, it's it's not just remembering that Jesus shed His blood a long time ago, but it continues to come to us, and we see it by faith. You know, all around us. You know, in, in the things even of the, our lives. Now again, not, not visibly, but, but invisibly. 
And we know that in all of that is, is again, life and its power because of the forgiveness and the assurance of salvation and, and, the, and the new living we're able to do by believing that that blood was shed for us. So again, marvelous thing that God provides water in one in you know for one at least overt purpose, shall we say, you know, to irrigate here the fields in this desert so that crops can be produced. But it also has all of this symbolic value because God's people just look at the world and the things of this world differently, right? We just see the world differently. Every drop of water we see is a remembrance of baptism. But one of the reasons why God gave these these this this these physical aspects to His creation, and then appointed them for His holy purposes, so that everything we see, you know, all creation, proclaims the glory of God, and and we can use all things both in the primary creation. That is the things that God himself has made, nature, if you will. But also also the secondary creation. You know, the wonderful things that you, dear people, make. You know, God makes them through you. You know, you're the means for that creation. You know, whether we're talking about food for, you know, your family and for yourself, again, it's God who has given the, the 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 intellect and the skills to you know to to whip up that dinner. But it's also God who has provided all the raw materials for that, by His blessing of the world with you know rain and sunshine and and warm temperatures and the like, you know, in due season to, for a bountiful harvest that that the people of the world can enjoy. You know, so that everything we see, whether whether natural or artificial, you know, we rightly can give thanks and praise to God. Of course, when we're looking at it rightly, you know, and we're, when we're using it rightly, you know, go, going back to an earlier example of what we were talking about uh, this evening, money, money is good, money is great, but the love of money and the pursuit of money for money's sake. It is not good, you know, for, for God's people. So all of that is what's signified. And the reminder, uh, again, that, you know, the, the it looks like blood brings us back to Egypt and all the lessons that that taught. You know, that this is indeed a very powerful God that when we appropriate that power through faith, when we let him use his power for our good, um, it's a very powerful thing in our lives indeed. 